Much appreciated. Good. Cheers. And the audience very engaged there, which is wonderful. So we talked about meeting clients and getting to know them in a, in a fast, quick way. And we talked about a technology first company. Well, it would be rude not to continue the technology first company and that theme. So our next speaker uh, is someone from a, from a company you all know very well. I think you've uh, probably downloaded or listened to tracks and tunes on it. But what we're going to talk about is behavioral behavioral habits of consumers and what they're doing and how they're doing. So to give you more insight into what their mind is thinking and to take us through that conversation, we have Richard Frankel, who is the creative director for Spotify. Thank you, Jeremy. Good luck, Richard. Thank you, very, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi, everybody. Look, we've heard so much about millennials and their impact on every aspect of society, of our culture. But how is that changing as they age? And what about this, this next wave, Gen Z? OK, I got to apologize. I know a lot of you have taken great effort to get here from the UK. And I'm from New York, and I don't actually speak English. We managed to get through the entire alphabet, A through Y, we did fine. And somehow we got to Z, and we had to improvise. So during this presentation, I'm going to be referring to that cohort as Gen Z. My apologies. But they are, Gen Z, what makes them tick? What inspires them? I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes giving you a little bit of insight of what we're learning from them. My name is Rich Frankel. I'm the global creative director at Spotify, which was founded by this guy, Daniel Ek. He calls himself a frustrated musician, a pretty decent programmer, and a massive music fan. And it's those three truths about Daniel that kind of made him the right person at the right time, and actually in the right place, Sweden, to lead a revolution in audio streaming that was centered around disrupting the disruptors. What he wanted to do was create a product that was better than piracy. Piracy, a decade ago, was bringing the music industry to its knees. Right there in that basic expression of his mission, of his intent, is the foundation for a company that to this day, a decade later, is still focused on artists and creators' livelihood, is focused on using technology as a method on delivering its mission, and is completely, completely obsessed with its users. At our company, the user comes first. So those users, these audiences, are what we're going to explore today. We've seen a massive change in what audiences expect from entertainment platforms and lifestyle, lifestyle platforms. I mean, this is the big idea right here, access over ownership. It's an idea we've seen disrupting all kinds of industries. It's been mentioned in a couple of the presentations earlier today. I mean, think about it, Uber and Lyft and automotive, or Netflix and video, or Airbnb and hospitality. It's this idea. But music is where this behavioral change began. It's where this transformation started with P2P sharing. Those of you who don't remember, that's piracy 1.0. But license streaming is what put the ship upright and set it back on course. So four years after Spotify launched in Sweden, the tide had shifted. 2012 was the first year that streaming revenue eclipsed MP3 downloads or physical sales of CDs in Sweden. And that's unbelievably fast. But truth be told, because of piracy, this behavior, this actual streaming of, of, of uh, content, or the expectation that all of the world's music would be sitting right there at your fingertips, this behavior had likely prevailed a decade earlier. It's just that nobody was measuring it, and certainly not monetizing it. So with Spotify came this first credible view of this sea change. Every stream bearing royalties, every user known. So about those users. We've got about 217 million active, monthly active users now. They're listening to 50 million tracks on the platform in 79 markets. And 10 billion times a month, we put a piece of content in front of a user that they have never heard before. That's what continues to let us feature discovery at the center of this big audio ecosystem that we're building. When people talk about our platform, we could, they can be heard saying, I opened my Spotify. That's a big win for us when we hear that. It's not just Spotify, it's not something we're making, it's something they're making. They recognize that together, with each one of them, we're creating these unique, personalized experiences that are safe 
and trusted and always there for them. So we wanted to know more about the forces that our users are feeling and the trends uh, and uncover cultural trends both on and off our platform. And that's what led us to this, Culture Next. It's a global trend report, and together with Trend Spotter's Culture Co-op, Spotify has tapped into our deep understanding of people through streaming and our connection to fans across the globe. And we did a deep dive with these guys to find out more. Our journey took us all around the world, unpacking Gen Z and millennials, evolving relationships with culture, with brands, with content, with technology, and with their communities, both digital and physical. We did focus groups, qualitative and quantitative studies, and by analyzing our own treasure trove of first-party data, we discovered five emerging trends. This seems to be the day of five trends. Um, you got five from Teeds, and you're going to get five from us now. But five emerging trends that are resonating globally across these generations. So this trend report, Culture Next, is due to be published on June 5th. And I'm going to give you, use this opportunity to give you guys a sneak peek at, at some of the things we've learned. Now, some of this stuff amplifies things, observations we've seen before, but a lot of it opens up new territories as we dive into this always connected generations. But the big thing that became clear to us through conversations, through interviews, through research, is that Gen Zs and Millennials are in the midst of a major wake-up call. The excitement of the last decade's te rapid technological growth has, has been replaced with a healthy do dose of skepticism. Young people are reevaluating their relationships with digital media criti and critically accessing the global and national political tsunami that seems to have hit so many of them with real, real impact. So five global trends stood out in our research for Culture Next. So, of course, we've named them. The first one is called Band of Others. And next is Subliminal Attraction. Then there's All the Feels, Polyfly, and fortuitously for us, and therefore the topic of this talk, surround sound. We'll get back to that later. Let's dig in and talk a little bit about this first trend. We're calling it, we're calling it band of others. This is something that we first identified in observations we made back in 2012, and we did our initial audience segmentation and research thinking about our own uh, marketing programs. And we see this trend growing everywhere now. I mean, the world is more diverse, cross-cultural, and migratory than ever. And young people are responding by creating communities that span the globe, made up of self-forming tribes who celebrate either the same microcultures or fringe fashion or food or social causes. These groups are forging bonds beyond social media to, to incite change and push the boundaries of belonging. And while these pockets of modern-day citizens might look like misfits or outliers, taken together, they have reached critical mass. They are more the norm than the anomaly. They're unanchored from roots, from rules, and from geographies, and they're drafting their own cultural manifestos. These generations are really the first global natives. 60% say that they're connected online with someone from a different country. And 42% identify more as a global citizen than as a citizen of their own country. So what does this cross-pollination look like in the real world? To see this first, firsthand, look no further than Nomadness Travel Tribe. This tribe is now approaching 22,000 members, and they're in all but 10 countries. And Nomadness is a community of primarily black female travelers who experience the world with people of their own demo on their own terms. For Evita Robinson, Nomadness founder, she says, the more off the grid, the better. I'm trying to seek those places that are more obscure, to see those hidden oases and gems that haven't been overrun, overpopulated, or overtaken. Avita's goal ties directly to one other trait of this cohort, which is purpose. These nomads are not only forming off-grid micro-communities, they are making them mission-driven. And while many of these groups are connecting in the real world, it's really important to remember that social media remains international waters. So what does that look like on Spotify? We thought we'd take a look to see if the user behavior we were seeing in the real world was reflected on the platform. Is it supporting this trend? So let's use K-pop as an example. I mean, what began as a South Korean movement quickly became a global craze. On Spotify, this genre is among the top 10 most streamed worldwide. 
Its success is due in large part to its celebration of differences. K-pop blends jazz, rap, classical music, reggae, folk, and EDM, not to mention visual references to cultures from nearly every continent. So we see this trend reflected broadly on our platform. 18 to 25-year-olds listen to more international music than any other demographic. And what's more, the listening diversity, which is the number of different artists that a user listens to in a given month, is highest among this age group. And here's the kicker. Spotify isn't even available in South Korea. So this isn't happening because of our platform authority or our clever marketing. It's just totally in the hands of our users that we're seeing this happen. The second trend is also tied to the influence of digital channels. It's not news that our real-world real desires are, are often rooted in our digital lives. But underlying the way we see, experience, and discover the world is an invisible force that we're just beginning to understand. The aesthetic sounds and images and voices that fill our social feeds and our online existence are creating an un, a collective unconscious, one that drives our attraction to people, places, and things. So often, unknowingly, the biggest cultural influencer is everyone, and simultaneously, no one at all. We're calling this subliminal attraction. When we asked Carla, 27, of Mexico City to retrace how she discovered Mia's secret neon yellow acrylic nail polish in a, in a neighborhood plaza, she told us it was subconscious. To be honest, I think that Instagram and Tumblr really play a big role in how I discover things, she said. When I see an image or video that I like, my mind subconsciously looks for things similar to those images that inspired me. Color is not the only thing wired into our digital subconscious. According to Gadi Amit, the founder of New Deal Design and the guy who created the Fitbit, technology has completely shifted our sensibility on modern design. Take the iPhone form, this rounded rectangle we call the square goal in design. It's been indoctrinated to everyone, and now the square goal is considered to be synonymous with proper, good design. Our research validates this concept. 60% of millennials and Gen Zs say that online aesthetics have altered what their generation expects to see in the real world. So, Amit tells us, every time we do something with sharp corners, people feel uncomfortable. All right, look at this slide. Does this slide make you uncomfortable? If it does, you could be a millennial. Let's see, is that better? There we go, okay. Beyond the visual realm, sound is shifting, also shifting the way we discover. Dan Macaroni, who's the co-founder of a company, Charming Robot, a product company in New York City, explains that podcasts have personalized audio in a way that influences us on a deeper level than the radio disc jockeys of yore because of the emotional connections that we have with podcasters. You're influenced by the ads read by podcast hosts because you trust them or like them. Your daily intimate interactions make you feel as though you know them. These ads become the equivalent of word of mouth. There's a guy named Cole Kushner who hosts a Spotify original podcast called Dissect. It's cultural journalism on a whole new level. He breaks down the music, messages, and cultural context of entire albums that are already well-loved by our audience. He brings a level of scrutiny and insight to this that you would expect from a forensic scientist. But what he's dissecting is a Lauryn Hill album or a Frank Ocean album. So it made sense when Sonos signed up to, to sponsor Dissect to just let Cole do his thing to them. That's not an easy thing for any brand to give up that much control. But Cole dissected the Sonos product, breaking down features and explaining how they fit into his life even bringing his daughter in to demonstrate how they listen to music together. Have a listen to how he brought this brand on board for his audience. Today's episode of Dissect is brought to you by Sonos. Sonos makes wireless home sound systems. And when I heard they signed on as a sponsor for season three, I was honestly thrilled. I'd already been using their Sonos One smart speaker for months. Of course, I had them send me more speakers, you know, for research purposes. Over the course of this season, I'm going to be dissecting Sonos, providing you with interesting facts about the brand, as well as sharing my personal experience with their products. Right out the gate, I've got to admit just how perplexed I was when I first heard the Sonos One in my home. It filled my entire dining room with crazy crisp, nuanced sound. 
It was hard to believe it was all coming from this unobtrusive little speaker. It turns out the engineers at Sonos designed the Sonos One with just this in mind. When you first set up your speaker, you map what they call the acoustic architecture of your room using the Sonos app on your smartphone. The speaker plays this series of futuristic bleeps and blobs. And as these sounds are playing, you walk around your room waving your smartphone. In just 30 seconds, it records over 100 impulse responses. It takes that acoustic measurement and instantly applies to your speaker a custom infinite impulse response filter. And the proof was in the pudding. The speaker simply sounds great. Anyway, I've got a bunch more to tell you about the family of Sonos products this season. Visit Sonos.com to learn more and use the promo code DISSECT to receive 10% off your first purchase. That's Sonos, S-O-N-O-S. Okay, you got it? There's this guy talking to his audience. That's not a six second ad. That's not a three second ad. That's not a 60 second ad. I don't know how long it is. At the very end is where the offer is and nobody is skipping it. People are listening to these advertisements all the way through because they're in the same editorial context and style and intimacy as the entire series. So he, all he's doing is what he does, but he's doing it for a brand instead of the subject of his show. These host-created ads are really something special. It's part subliminal and part trust. It's a powerful one-two punch. And like what psychologists have always said that, you know, Sound has always influenced our desires. You hear that Coke, you hear the Coke ad with ice cubes hitting the side of the glass and you get thirsty. Or you hear a Pringles potato chip crunch and you want to pop open a can. So, so you know, this is just a, a new landscape and a new way of thinking about how to communicate authentically through audio with audiences. Today, with the rise of digital, according to a Forbes article in 2017, we now encounter an estimated 4,000 to 10,000 ads a day. Our brains can't possibly process all that information, or can they? For the next trend, let's get political, or at least let's see how politics ties into pop culture. Political science has graduated from a college major to a cultural obsession. In today's pop culture, politics is unavoidable. From late night monologues to, to viral videos to your old best friend from school's uh, viral um, social media rants, we are a far cry from the apathetic hipster culture that ushered in the 21st century. This new trend, polyfly, is a breakdown of pop gone political. It's the new mashup of politics with fashion, food, entertainment, and more born from today's angsty intellectualism. The intersection of these worlds is hardly new, from Woodstock to We Are the World to Spitting Image to 45 years of cold opens on Saturday Night Live. Politics has long been a threat in entertainment. But 2015 and 2016 marked an inflection point, spurred by the US presidential campaign and election, by Brexit, by NFL player protests, by Parkland student-led rallies, by the Me Too movement, and many more watershed events. We're seeing an increase of young people at protests, at rallies, and at marches. But the fact that young people are taking political action doesn't mean that they're foregoing those fashion mags or those hilarious memes or binge-worthy TV shows. Instead, they've come to expect these cultural entities to serve up pop with a side of civics. 45% of millennials and Gen Z say they have a hard time knowing where politics drops off and pop culture picks up. Music and podcasts, too, have, been taken, have taken a decidedly political vent. From Childish Gambino's Grammy winning This Is America to the formerly apolitical Taylor Swift imploring her fans to go vote, to reports that both Rihanna and Cardi B turned down the Super Bowl halftime show in solidarity with former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick. On Spotify, we, songs, we saw songs with socially relevant messages take hold on the global charts last year as people turned to music to get inspired and artists use it to, to use the platform to share their views. And millennials and Gen Zs want brands to have a voice. In our survey, we found that 68% say brands need to promote more progressive value, values and play a more meaningful role in society. And 58% appreciate it when brands tell the world exactly where they stand and the causes they support through their products and marketing. On Spotify, we saw a few brands bring this to life on the platform last year. We teamed up with Smirnoff to, to explore the music industry's gender gap. 
Our equalizer tool analyzed streamers' listening histories, tallying up female versus male musicians in their playlist. And then it generated a more balanced playlist. The campaign generated buzz, and it also generated impact, pushing listeners to think about how they stream and how the industry's gender balance problem affects them. Yes, these generations are more and more vocal about politics, but they're also more vocal about their feelings in general. Drake told the world that he's caught up in his feelings and it's safe to say he is not alone. There is a palpable strain of melancholy running through culture today that Gen Zs and millennials are openly addressing. Not only are they turning to their bag playlist, for those of you who don't know what those are, those are playlists just filled with sad songs, and listening to emo rap, which was Spotify's number one rising genre in 2018, they're also proactively taking steps to improve their mental wellness. Plus, they're finding deep camaraderie in opening, in openly expressing these feelings. In our research, we discovered there's been profound community building that's arisen from this openness and vulnerability. We heard a lot about vulnerability this morning, so I was pleased to see this as, a trend, as part of the trend that came forward. After a digital decade spent tweeting, snapping, posting, scrolling, and just generally zoning out, it's understandable that we're feeling less than great. In fact, social media pressure has made us feel pretty damn bad. But beyond dreary news feeds and social media burnout, something bigger seems to be at play. Gen Zs and millennials are readily sharing that they're lonely. Ironically, it's self a communal act. There's a newfound openness in talking about mental health. Even Sunny D, the American happy-go-tangy beverage brand, attempted to connect on social media last year by posting, I can't do this anymore. This makes sense when you consider that 50% of millennials and Gen Zs told us their generation finds camaraderie in sharing deep feelings, including sadness and loneliness. In 2018, Kanye West put mental health front and center as a core theme of his new album, scrolling, I hate being bi bipolar, it's awesome, across his album cover. His lyrics and public statements were part of a much larger conversation around mental health and entertainment. Lady Gaga, Selena Gomez, Ryan Reynolds, and The Rock are just a few of the celebrities who have opened up about their struggles with anxiety and depression. Even in the hyper-performance world of professional sports, we're seeing athletes begin to speak freely about their emotional struggles. NBA star Kevin Love spent a lot of 2018 recounting his experience with panic attacks and anxiety in his interviews, his essays, and on social media. So before we dig into this last trend, surround sound, I want to explain how we're, using, how we're ratifying these insights at Spotify. We're using our own first-party user and repertoire data to understand how audiences are either leading or echoing these trends on our platform. It all comes down to the power of audio. The streaming audio audience is expanding at an unprecedented pace. With more than 50 million songs and 9 million podcast episodes in the palm of our hands, people can now listen to audio content just about anywhere, anytime. And unlike any time in history, these users are known respected, and participate in the curation of these experiences. So consider the quality of the content. Besides our comprehensive music catalog, there's an incredible amount of inventive and relevant audio content coming out in the forms of podcasts and audiobooks. And podcasts are fueling this growth. To put it in perspective, it is estimated that over 200,000 podcasts were launched in 2018. And there's probably now about 700,000 podcasts currently in circulation worldwide across all the podcast distributors. That means roughly 500 new podcasts are launching every single day. So our understanding of your audience, the people you're trying to reach, comes from our authentic connection to them in a myriad of moments throughout their day. That's because we own ear time. I can ask you to close your eyes and not look at that slide but I can't ask you to close your ears and stop listening to what I have to say. We've built Spotify to be everywhere that music and podcasts can be. More streaming moments means more opportunities for brands to connect to their audiences in the right moment and context. But even beyond accessibility and quality of content, there are those other reasons we've been discussing why streaming audio is becoming so central to people's lives. Those are discovery and personalization. 
Like platforms like Spotify and Netflix are leveraging state-of-the-art machine learning to surface hyper-personalized content specifically for each of us as consumers. Back in 2015, we launched our popular Discover Weekly, a revolutionary playlist that uses machine learning algorithms to personalize a weekly playlist of 30 songs for every user, 30 tracks we believe they will love and we know they've never listened to on Spotify. That is the equivalent for us of, the, of what Ian was just talking about, that group of, co of programmers sitting in a room and they emerge out of the room and there's this piece of magic that they've made. That's exactly how that was made at Spotify. It came out of a Hack Week project that our, our uh, teams rejected twice before we finally got it right, but they kept iterating and believing on it and we ended up with something that is absolutely central to how we're known in the industry now. And now we're working on expanding that we want that content recommendation system to work for non-music, for spoken word content as well. So we're developing technology to help users discover new or unheard podcast episodes that we believe they will want to hear. So this last trend, surround sound, is tied to what we at Spotify know best, audio. After a decade dominated by, visu by visual media and culture, sound is taking center stage. This is due in no small part to the innovation and ubiquity of streaming audio. Through playlists, podcasts, connected cars, gaming consoles, smart speakers, and more, sound surrounds us every day, everywhere. The globalization of music introduces us to underexplored cultures. Self-help podcasts calm our nerves. True crime podcasts keep us hooked, whether we're commuting or cooking. Sound walks help us tune into our own physical environments. And while sound has always been a part of our lives, we're now taking a step back to realize just how influential it can be. To understand this profound shift, all we have to do is listen. Millennials and Gen Zs communicate as much through GIFs, photos, and emojis as they do words, but audio is getting a new listen. And it's worth noting that smart speakers are infiltrating our lives at a faster rate than smartphones. According to a 2018 report from eMarketer, global use of connected speakers increases 48% every year. Just last year on Spotify, we saw the number of streams on smart speakers double from the year before. Overall, the ubiquity of on-demand audio has had a huge impact. Our research reveals that the majority of Gen Zs and Millennials believe that music streaming has had a bigger influence on their lives than Instagram. The global rise of podcasts has been massive. Last year, Spotify, we saw podcast consumption hours increase 250% worldwide. This is in large part due to the medium's inherent authenticity and intimacy. As Anna Zoe puts it, a podcast is just like listening to someone at a table next to you in a cafe talk about something very interesting. So in closing, the cultural forces that affect the lives of Gen Zs and Millennials are intensely powerful. Whether it's a daily struggle to manage meaning and purpose in an increasingly political culture that moves at breakneck speed, or a globe's worth of life-affirming music at their fingertips. But make no mistake, the ways in which these digitally native, highly engaged, and emotionally in touch individuals are responding is in turn changing and shaping our culture. They embrace their own influence and their inherent power and march toward change, soundtracking every step and finding allies at every turn. Empathetic brands, who understand where this generation is coming from and where they're headed, as laid out, laid out in the five trends we've uncovered, will be better equipped to connect in an authentic way with their desired audiences. You might be tempted to frame these connections as smart marketing opportunities, but given the nature of the trends we are reporting and the depth with which these new generations have embraced their own beliefs and strengths, our advice to brands who want to succeed now and in the future is to think of these connections not just as opportunities, but more importantly, as obligations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Very, very interesting behavioral habits there. Very great insight. Um, I know you, you all want to go to lunch, but does anyone have a question for Richard on some of that insight? Or are you still digesting and taking it in? Okay, Richard, are you around for the I'm rest here. of the day? I'm here. Come so find me. If you uh, want to talk to him over a sandwich or a bit of salad, please uh, don't hesitate. We are publishing this much deeper report on the 5th of June. We're localizing it for many markets, so 
Anybody who wants to get a copy of it will be happy to provide you with a link. Find me or my colleagues, Marta or Rocha here, or um, Craig or Teresa there, and we will be sure to make sure you get it as soon as it's published. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, and well done, everyone.